Shalom. Today we're going to look at an interesting language correspondence which we find in a passage of scripture. The event is in John 7, 37 through 38. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Yeshua stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Where does it mention this in the scripture? There are a few ideas about the water flowing. Isaiah 55, 1. Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. If you're thirsty, come to the water. Isaiah 58, 11. And Jehovah shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones. Thou shalt be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. Jeremiah 17, 13. O Jehovah, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken Jehovah, the fountain of living water. So Yehovah is considered to be the fountain of the water. We can drink of that water. Here's an interesting note right here where it says the hope of Israel. The word there is actually mikvah. So if you know that the national anthem of Israel is called the hope, it's ha-tikva. And uh, there's another video on this channel that goes further into depth on that. But it's interesting, the hope there refers to the pool of water. Yeshua continued with this theme of the living water, John 4:14. 4, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Of course, this is not the scripture that Yeshua is referring to, in John chapter 7. This is from a later period. Revelation 22, 17, also from a later time, but carrying the same theme. And the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that heareth say, come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Now there is a prophecy in Deuteronomy 18, 18. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, speaking of Moses, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him, a prophecy of the coming Messiah. So just as Moses brought water to the people in the desert, the Jews acknowledge that the latter Redeemer is to produce water for them, just as the former. Some other references to the coming water. Zechariah 14, 8 and 9. And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, and half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. And Jehovah shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Jehovah, and his name one. There's an interesting thing to think about. In Ezekiel 47, 1 and 2. Afterward he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. For the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. Then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward, and led me about the way, without until the utter gate by the way that looketh eastward, Behold, there ran out waters on the right side. You might have heard in the news some years ago that it looked like there was water beginning to flow, possibly in the Western Wall. I can't remember where it exactly was, and everybody was very excited, but it turned out it was just a broken pipe. Now later we find that water comes from the rock. 1 Corinthians 10.4 And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Messiah. Messiah is defined as the stone of Israel in Genesis 49:24. But his bow abode in strength, 
and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel, a messianic reference. Now, the time of John chapter 7, when Yeshua stands up to say this, is the last day of the great feast. The great feast is tabernacles. And the last day is called Shemini Atzeret. It's the eighth day, and it's a solemn assembly. You can read about that in Leviticus 23. There is a ceremony that is well documented in post-biblical literature. It's not mentioned in the Bible, but it is very relevant to what was happening at the time when Yeshua stood up. So we're going to talk about that. It's called the water pouring ceremony, and it is called in Hebrew, Bet Hasho'eva, the, pulling, the house of pulling forth the water. So these next few pieces are from the Talmud. In regard to the rite of water libation performed in the temple during the festival, how was it performed? One would fill a golden jug with a capacity of three log, that's about 30 ounces, with water from the Siloam pool. The carrying of the water up the steps to the temple was accompanied by various shofar blasts. The priest ascended the ramp of the altar and turned to his left. There were two silver basins there into which he poured the water. The two basins were perforated at the bottom with two thin perforated nose-like protrusions. One of the basins used for the wine libation had a perforation that was broad and one used for the water libation had a perforation that was thin so that the flow of both the water and the wine, which did not have the same viscosity, would conclude simultaneously. This is from Mishnah Sukkah 4. So here is a picture of the altar in the temple, and there is a receptacle on either side. And think about the math. They understood that water and wine will not drip down the altar at the same rate of speed. So they have different size holes in the bottom of the basin where they're pouring the liquid. And they are both, the water and the wine are both poured simultaneously and they run down on either side of the altar and they come down at the same time. Does this make you think of anything? How about this? John 1934. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. Continuing with the description of the Beit HaShoeva, the water pouring ceremony. The temple courtyard was lit up by four candelabras that was so bright that there was not a courtyard in Jerusalem that was not illuminated from the light from the place of the drawing of the water. The pious and the men of action would dance before the people who attended the celebration. The flaming torches that they would juggle in their hands and they would say before them passages of song and praise to God. And the Levites would play on lars, harps, cymbals, and trumpets, and countless other musical instruments. So this is a time of great, great rejoicing. The sages taught one who did not see the celebration of the place of the drawing of the water never saw celebration in his life. So those are from Sukkah 51a and b. Now remember the water is coming from the pool of Siloam, which is fed by the Gihon Spring. The Gihon Spring is the main source of water for the pool of Siloam. Hezekiah built the pool of Siloam to, to divert the Gihon Spring away from the besieging army and towards the city to bring water into the city. It is the source of water for the city of Jerusalem. And you can read about that in Second Chronicles. The first time we see the word Gihon is in Genesis 2.13. Remember there are four head rivers that come out from the river in Eden. And the name of the second river is Gihon, the same as that that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. We also find that Solomon was anointed king at the Gihon, 1 Kings 1.33. The king also said unto them, Take with you the servants of your Lord, and cause Solomon my son to ride on mine own mule, and bring him down to Gihon, from verse 45. And Sadok the priest and Natan the prophet have anointed him king in Gihon, and they are come up from thence rejoicing, so that the city rang again. This is the noise that ye have heard. We might consider that the anointing of Solomon is a shadow picture of the beginning of the Messianic age, 
and I've talked about that elsewhere. Now there is a cognate word with the same letters in Hebrew, which is gachon. You see the gimel, chet, and nun, they're the same. We'll talk about the relationship in a minute. It only appears twice in Genesis 3:14. And Yehovah God said to the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So this word gachon is going to refer specifically to a snake or reptile belly. It's also mentioned in Leviticus 11.42. Whosoever goeth upon the belly, and whosoever goeth upon all four, and whatsoever hath more feet among all creeping things that creep upon the earth, them ye shall not eat, for they are an abomination. Now, Leviticus 11.42 is sometimes called the belly, the gachon of the Torah, and in a scroll, the vav of the word gachon is an oversized letter, which if you can read the letters, you can see the picture here. We have talked about before how not all the letter anomalies are in every printed copy of the Torah. They are in every handwritten scroll of Torah. They will appear, but not every book printed version will show these things but some of them do. So we just read this verse, everything that goes on its gachon and everything on four legs, etc. Why is it called the belly of the Torah? It is said that if you count all the letters from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Deuteronomy, this letter is the middle letter of the Torah. So it is the belly, the middle of the Torah. And not only that, but the verse, as you see, is talking about animals that are clean and unclean, about kashrut, what is kosher, and so it refers to your belly as well. Now, what is the connection between these two ideas? They come from a verb root, goach or giach, which means to spew forth or to slither or crawl. And here is a nicely drawn picture, I did not draw it, of the movement of the snake, and you can see also it's very similar to the movement of a winding river. They're both moving forward in a certain pattern. Now this verb is used in several places. Job 38.8 Or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of a womb? Interesting image of water rushing forth, similar to a birth. Psalm 22.9 But thou art he that took me out of the womb, Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast, the one who delivered me, who caught me as I was being born, as I came out, another spewing forth and a coming forth with water. Again, Ezekiel 32, 2. Son of man, take up a lamentation for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say to him, Thou art like a young lion of the nations. Thou art as a whale in the seas. Thou camest forth with thy rivers, and troublest the waters with thy feet, and foulest their rivers. Again, a spewing forth, a coming forth, that is attached to water. So when Yeshua stood up to say this, in the context of the water drying ceremony, and all the things that that, that entailed, the water and the blood running down the two sides of the altar at the same time, I don't think anyone, any Hebrew speaker, would have missed this kind of play on words that out of his belly is coming forth the living water, the living water that they had brought up from Siloam, from the Gihon spring, that that is going to come out of the Gachon, the belly. And again, he is initiating the Messianic kingdom. As Solomon made a picture of that at the Gihon spring, this is a form of announcement of that actually taking place, the initiation of the Messianic Kingdom. I pray that this is edifying to you. Until next time, Tasimita Inayim Ahashamayim, keep your eye on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.